Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Lynn O'Hara, and I'm the Director of Programs here at National History Day. This is the first in our series of five, what we're calling the Ask an NEH Expert series. The goal of this series is to connect our students who are transitioning from research into project development to connect them with experts who use the same skills that they're using for their National History Day projects into the real world. So I'd just like to give a quick shout out to the people who are joining us live tonight. First off, I've got Cheryl Kasky. Cheryl is the NHD in Kentucky coordinator. Also have Kevin Wagner. Kevin is a Bering teacher winner from Pennsylvania and some of his students ran into some conflicts with some school events but he's got some of their questions tonight. We're also going to go out live a little later to Topeka, Kansas uh, with Mr. Kyle Johnson and his students at Seaman Middle School. Uh, and we have our expert, Rebecca Fetterman, who we're going to introduce in just a moment. But what I would like to do is turn things over now to Karen Kenton. Karen is the Senior, Programs, Senior Program Officer in NEH's Division of Public Programs. Thanks for joining us, Karen. Thank you, Lynn. And thanks to all our guests for hanging out with us tonight. Just like to say a few words about NEH. Uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities is a federal agency that funds research, preservation, and education in the humanities. And by humanities, we mean literature, history, philosophy, among other fields of study. NEH supports a wide range of activity, creation of books, documentary films, exhibitions, historical interpretation, and websites like the one we'll review tonight. NEH was founded in 1965 because Congress recognized that history matters. And here at NEH, we understand that National History Day matters. NEH has supported National History Day since its founding. We continue to sponsor the first place NEH Scholar Medals at the national competition, and we offer a special prize across all History Day submission formats for excellent use of historic newspapers found in Chronicling America. What's Chronicling America? It is a free online database which includes over 6 million digitized historic newspaper pages. It's free. The database includes features that allow you to easily save full or partial pages and because they are all in the public domain, you can use them freely in your homework and History Day projects. NEH's excitement team is proactively working to support educators and students. On the excitement website, you'll find over 500 lesson plans and over 400 vetted websites. Also, excitement created three special features just for you, National History Day students working on projects related to this year's theme of leadership and legacy. You'll find lesson plans and a collection of reviewed websites that can add greater insight into your topic. You'll find a lesson introducing you to the Chronicling America database and how to use it most efficiently for your research. And you'll find tips and techniques for searching Chronicling America for articles relating to leadership and legacy. And teachers, there's something for you too. I hope you will consider applying to NEH's summer programs. Each year, NEH offers tuition-free opportunities for educators to study a variety of humanities topics. Stipends are provided to help cover expenses for these one to five week programs. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the State Humanities Councils. Many participate in History Day and offer their own educational resources. You can find a full list of councils at NEH.gov. So we are so fortunate to have with us tonight Rebecca Fetterman. She's the Electronic Resources Coordinator and Culinary Collections Librarian for the New York Public Library. Rebecca is also the co-project curator for What's on the Menu. NEH is proud to support What's on the Menu which is an innovative online project that is a really valuable resource for the general public, for scholars of all ages, and that includes you, National History Day students. <laughs> Rebecca is going to tell us all about it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Rebecca. 
Thank you for having me, and thank you for the NEH to the NEH for 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 sponsoring what's on the menu for contributing, and thank you for inviting me to be part of of History Day today. I'm really flattered to be and honored to be invited. Um, yes. <laughs> so should I Great. just kind thanks, of, Rebecca. Yeah. Really quick, just before we get started, we've got a bunch of questions for you that some of our students have sent in, but I wanted to start off with just mentioning to everybody who's listening live that everyone can send in live questions. We're doing it via Twitter. They send them in using the hashtag NHD Hangouts, and we're monitoring the Twitter feed live, and we're going to get as many questions, not only from our live students and teachers, but also from the ones online over the course of the hour. So I just want to mention that while we get started. But Rebecca, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's on the menu, what it is, um, and how you guys kind of came up with this idea? Because I think it's really creative. Sure. Uh, what's on the menu is a website where we've taken a lot of our menus that are in the New York Public Library's collections. We've digitized them. We make them available online. And what we do is we ask the public to transcribe them for us. Um, and the way this got started was um, there's a little history of the library's menu collection. A lot of people don't think that the New York Public Library would have a collection of menus, but we do. We have roughly 45,000 restaurant menus in the collection dating from the mid-19th century, pretty much the present day. And um, what we were noticing was that a lot of people who were coming in to use the menus were looking for very specific dishes on the menus. They were looking for the appearance of oysters, or they were looking to see when a certain dish came into popularity and when it sort of became less popular. Um, and there was no real way to get access to that granular information the way that the menus had been organized. So what we decided to do was simply take some of the menus that had already been digitized um, and ask the public to simply transcribe them for us, to simply write down the dishes on each menu with the prices. And that kind of created a database of dishes. So you can search for Sanka coffee and you can see how popular it was over time and you can see how much it cost and um, you can see when it sort of started to disappear from menus. And you can do that with almost every dish that appears on the menus. So it became a way of sharing our menu collection online and also sharing a piece of information that hadn't been accessible prior to being put online, which are the dishes on the menus. Well, that's really interesting. Can you maybe mention how NHD students might be interested or might, you know, why might they want to look at a menu from different periods in history? Yeah, I mean, menus are a piece of everyday life that um, is sometimes hard to find in other places. Um, menus are a piece of ephemera and basically what ephemera means is that um, it's a it's a document that has a short time span. Um, so a movie stub ticket, you know, you went to see um, Hunger Games and you know you went and now the movie's over, that ticket stub is not going to get you into another movie, but you have this ticket stub and what kind of informational value does this ticket stub have for future researchers or future scholars. The same with the menu. So you've got a menu, you go out to dinner and you get a menu and you can order from the menu when you get it but you know once that restaurant goes out of business or a year from now you can't you can't use that menu for much but you can and so that's why libraries collect menus and we're not the only library that collects menus there are many many libraries across the country that collect menus because researchers find them really helpful in examining what kinds of foods people were eating what kind of language was used to describe foods how the meals were organized um, what prices. Um, we had a researcher who was a marine biologist who was actually looking at our menus and the fishes, the fish, the fish dishes on each menu to examine what the neighboring water, what the what the surrounding waters of New York, what kinds of fish were were prevalent and how much they cost. Um, so people use menus in a lot of different ways, and they're they're such a moment in everyday life um, that oftentimes historians or novelists will use a menu to get a period detail. So how much did that Sanka cup, coffee, cup of coffee cost? Um, so it's, it's really unique information that can't really be, you can't really get it in a lot of other places. Well, that's interesting. So you have this collection of menus in the library. So how is it that you transition this collection into making a website? 
That's a good question. So um, it took a lot of, um, well, we had to give you, we had about 10,000 menus. Of the 45,000 menus, about 10,000 had already been digitized for a, for a project that the library had done a few years before. So we already had some menus that had already been filmed. Um, and so what we did was I and my, myself and some other colleagues had this idea of putting them online and making them into objects that could be transcribed. That instead of just having a static image online, we wanted to invite people to participate and interact with the object. So we really wanted to be able to zoom in on the menus, to be able to read the fine print, and to be able to transcribe the dishes. Um, so it was really about coming together with um, interested parties at the library, finding out what the goal of the project was. What did we want people to be able to do with these online menus and what kind of website would we be able to create from that end goal? So we really needed the end goal in sight before we even figured out how to go about designing the website. I think that's a really good point because a lot of NHD students find that that organization piece and having a plan, it's as important as a website as it is in a paper or a performance. Um, can you talk a little bit about when you started kind of this planning process, what were some of the challenges or the stumbling blocks that you and your team ran into? We had many stumbling blocks. <laughs> um, well, we wanted... The goal of the project was really to be able to create a database of dishes. That was really the, the goal when we started the project. So um, how would the users type in the dish? Um, but then we also wanted the researchers who come to this website after the dishes have been transcribed to be able to interact with it. And how would these researchers be using the website? So we knew we needed a really robust search engine or a search box within the website so that it would come up with the relevant results. And we needed some way to organize the menus. So we have so many menus in our collection. Um, how do we organize them? And the way that they're organized in the physical boxes is usually chronologically. So you would go through boxes of 1910 menus and you would literally just flip through them hoping to find these dishes. So we wanted to continue that same organization so we have them available chronologically so you can browse by date or um, search by a dish. So we wanted some way of having both the ability to search and the ability to browse um, because we really realize that people really enjoy the experience of browsing and sometimes websites don't provide a lot of a, a sort of a, a nice way to browse. They sort of assume everybody has something they're searching for but browsing is a way of bringing information out to people that they didn't even know that they were interested in. Okay, now I, I think that's a really kind of interesting what our students need to think about is that you don't just need to think about being, putting it up there, but you need to think about your viewer. So in this case, your teacher or the NHD judge who's going to be looking through that website. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you sat down with the team to plan it um, in terms of what would you put on it, what did you you put on and what did you choose not to put on? Because part of building a web, talk a little bit about how you planned that. Sure. Um, well, we wanted, the goal was really also to make a website that was easy to use. So sometimes the information that, so what we were doing with our website was we were inviting people to participate. Um, so we wanted to make the experience of participating as easy to do as possible. So we wanted the, the site design to be very, very clean and not be sort of cluttered or intimidating. Um, we also didn't require any registration. And I'm sure none of your websites will require registration, but a lot of websites, especially if you're participating, like transcribing things, sometimes they might. We really didn't want any barrier to participation. We really wanted to invite everybody to be able to use this and to feel comfortable using it and to feel comfortable enough to come back to use it again and again. And we wanted to create a website that was as much of a 
sort of an interesting place to look at old menus as much as it would be a tool for researchers to come back to and to use. So we wanted to make it um, very clean, very simple, because the objects that we were highlighting could sometimes be complicated. So the design of the site we really wanted to make as clean and as user-friendly as possible. Okay. Sorry, I think there was a little bit of a breakup on that one, but we'll come back to some of those ideas in just a minute. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. When you're creating this website or any other website and you're using an object, whether it be the image of a menu or a photograph or a video, how important is citing that? And how is it that you need to do that when you do a website? It's extremely important. Um, so we are fortunate. I mean, the menus in our collection. When you put when we when we put a menu on line, um, there is metadata, which basically means there's information about the object that's right next to the image of the menu. So you get to see what um, the restaurant name is, and you see where it's from and the date, so that if somebody's interested in the menu, that there's information about that menu. So we provide all of that. Um, but we also want to provide, um, and, and all the objects on our website are sort of the property of the New York Public Library. But we also need to be sure that people understand where this information came from. So it's extremely important when you're putting information online that you cite where it came from so that if somebody has more questions, they can go back to that site. They can go back to the NEH or they can go back to the Library of Congress or they can go back to the New York Public Library and find out more information about that image or that object. Um, and sometimes if you can insert a link so that it goes directly back to sort of the page where that image came from, that's always great as well. As much information as you can provide about the image or about what you're citing, it's extremely important. Well, I think that that's a good point because here at History Day, we teach our students to give credit. So if, let's say, they wanted to use one of your menus on their website, they can. It's fair game, Absolutely. but they would have to give a credit for the New York Public Library. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, in their annotated bibliographies, because every project has an annotated bibliography in History Day, that's where they would give the information, including a judge or story to the link to go back more. So, so I'm glad to see that you guys are doing exactly the kinds of things we're teaching our students to do. Yes, um, but definitely. let me ask you a question. When you're putting these up there, sometimes we students get stuck and we talk a lot about historical context. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about putting the image there, but can you explain what that means to you guys in your project and your team when they're working with these images or menus or other artifacts? It's a little different it's a little bit different in our case. Um, we have a website, yes, and we're putting all of these menus online, but in some ways our m website is also something like a database. So we provide some sort of context because we're putting it in chronological order in many cases, um, and we soon will be, we also have and will soon be adding geographic tagging. So if you're interested in looking for all the menus within New York City or all the menus in Topeka, Kansas, you'll be able to go geographically to that tag. Um, so that's putting it in some sort of context. Um, but it's also sort of a database. So it's really just it's their menus sort of listed. Um, when looking at how other people are using our menus and adding them to their own websites, or if they're writing an article, or they're writing a book about food history, and they're including some of our menus, then it's put into a much greater context. So if somebody's interested in looking at um, the history of hotels, let's say, in New York City, and what were some of the menus that were in these hotels. Um, you might provide some of the menus from, you know, the St. Nicholas Hotel, but then you would provide information about what the St. Nicholas Hotel was, what neighborhood it was in, what was going on in that time period, that there might be certain dishes on that menu, maybe it's during the Civil War, and so there might be dishes that you wouldn't necessarily see, or there might be dishes that are not on the menu after the Civil War. So you're framing it in some sort of historical context. And menus are interesting objects because without that, they are just items. Um, but when you put it into a greater context and you understand where this menu came from, the time period you're talking about, um, people might have been at that particular dinner, there's a much greater context and, and it's much more, it's a richer historical document once you add that 
context to the object. Otherwise, it's just an image in many ways. Well, I think, too, it shows your judges that it's it's not just you know that this is an image of a menu from the Civil War, right. but that it's an image that you know a lot more about, because a lot of times our students know a lot more, especially than they can put on their websites. Um, can you talk a little bit about drawing conclusions in history? Because I know that's something that is a challenge for a lot of our students, and I think sometimes they get caught in a trap where they think they should just take their introduction and what their thesis or their argument is, and then they kind of just restate it, sometimes with a couple different words. Can you talk a little bit about conclusions? Um, and how you draw conclusions. In <laughs> They're the toughest part. Um, again, sort of when you're when we ha with our menus, um, we make okay. So for what we do as a library, it's a little bit different. Also, so what the goal of a library is really to provide information and to preserve this information and to make this information, whether or not it's a menu or an image or a book to preserve this information and make it available to researchers, um, whether you're in high school, middle school, college, or you're a professor. Um, so what we hope to do is that people will come to the library, make use of this, for example, the menus on our website, um, and craft an argument about, let's say, what was going on in restaurants in the North versus the South during the Civil War. What kinds of things were appearing on menus? Um, looking at but, you know, talking about context, what were the menu? What were the restaurants in the north? What were the restaurants in the south? Um, and then seeing what you can gather from all of this information, and then crafting an argument based on the kinds of information that we're providing for you. Um, so conclusions can be really difficult. So it's really about taking the information that you have access to through libraries, um, and sort of crafting an argument based on what you're finding in these documents. So it, it can be really challenging, um, and I guess I wish I had a better answer than that, but it's really about sort of taking a lot of this information and, and, and looking at it with a critical eye and trying to understand what kinds of, um, what kind of arguments you can thread through each. Okay, and my last question, and then we're actually going to go out to Topeka, Kansas, to some of our middle school students here. But my question is, how important is revision? When you're building a website like this, um, in what ways have you revised the website? In what ways does your team continue to revise the website? It Revision is everything. Um, we started off with a web page that looked a, quite a bit different than the one that is available on site now. Um, and we were constantly revising it because the way that researchers were using it wasn't necessarily the way it was built. So for example, the search box. If you were searching for a particular menu, sometimes you would get that menu, but sometimes it would just pull up the keywords. Um, so we needed a much more robust and functional search box so that researchers who were using it could find that they what they needed in one in one fell swoop. Um, we also wanted to, and this is something that's really important with websites, is that there's so much information often on websites and you don't necessarily want it all on one page, but you also don't want to hide some of the content too, too deeply. So how can you pull out some of the interesting content and make it available to researchers? So how do you make um, some of the unusual dishes that were appearing on menus? So we brought that out and put it on the front page so that if you see something unusual you might it might sort of pique your curiosity and you would do a little bit more research on that. The goal is really to um, if people are interested in dishes and foods over time we wanted to make sure that people knew what you could find in our database and and make it discoverable. Um, so that's sort of again talking about browsing versus searching and making the search box perfectly you know work really well so that researchers if they have something really specific they're looking for can find it but then also making something discoverable and browsing and sort of allowing serendipity to happen. Um, but that's, you know, that sort of aside, the revision though is constant. We are constantly getting feedback from our users. We're constantly playing around with it ourselves. We're constantly seeing what could be done that's a little bit better and adding new tools. So revision is hugely important. I think you really hit the nail on the head when you talked about the idea that it's so, so important to go ahead and listen to the users, to you know show your website in development when it's in the rough draft stages to other students, to parents, teachers, friends, grandma, anybody who you can talk into looking at it. 
because I think that feedback is a really critical process because it might seem logical for you how to get from one page to another and it might be confusing your view maybe you need to put a button in there and again that's a simple fix that can really help make your website much more navigable Yes. Great. Well, let's do this. Uh, these are some really good questions, but I know there's a lot more questions out there. And our goal between now and the next 35 minutes is to answer as many questions as we have. So we're going to go live to some of our live students now. But for everybody who's watching out there, please tweet your questions. Use the hashtag NHD Hangouts, and we'll answer as many of them as we can. So at this point, uh, Mr. Johnson, do any of your students out in Seaman Middle School in Topeka, Kansas have questions for Rebecca? or for Cheryl Kasky, who's our NHD coordinator, on with us tonight. Yeah, uh, thanks for having us tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our students who uh, have some questions for you. What are some qualities on a website that aren't appealing to people? That aren't oh. appealing? Aren't appealing, yeah. That's a great question. Well, um, I um, things that aren't appealing. I think when you have too much clutter on a page, when it's hard to read, it, it's when things there's too much information on one page. I think is not the best design. Um, when you have too many fonts on one page, um, I think the goal is to keep things as clean and simple as possible, and then you usually can't go wrong. I think when the sort of when you start adding. Um, different kinds of fonts and too much information. I think that's when, that's when the problems start. But by keeping everything clean and simple, I don't think you can ever go wrong with that. that that's that's a really good point too, because I think we've all had the experience where we go to a website and it's just full of text that's in really tiny font, all crammed together. Let's be honest. What do most people do when they go to that website? Go no no no. I'm going to go back and find something else. And you don't want somebody to have that reaction when they come to your website, especially because there could be some really good information there. But right. chunking it and spacing it up and like you said, making it clean and clutter free, think the way your room should be at home, can be a really good trick in terms of looking at a website. Well, how about some other questions, Mr. Johnson? Um, in your opinion, what is appealing on a website? What oh, is so the appealing? the opposite question. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, I am drawn to websites that are intuitive. So when I go to a website, I want to know what I'm supposed to do and where I'm supposed to go on this website. And I want to know what kind of information you're trying to convey to me. So sometimes it's just a simple couple of sentences or paragraph that gives information about what the goal of the site is and how you want the user to interact with it. Um, I think the navigation should be relatively simple. Um, and just intuitive, and I sort of a site that I know where to go if I'm finding something. I know where the search box is, but I also know how to get to the next page. Um, I also like images. I think just text can be really hard for someone to, you know, people would like to see pictures and images, and that's why you're putting them online. Otherwise, you might as well just, you know, write a story or an article. So having a mixture of images and, in, you know, an intuitive interface is always really appealing, at least to me. Sometimes what's one of the comments that I get from our teachers or hear from NHD judges is that a website is more than just a paper with pictures. We have a paper category, we're going to talk about that later, but think about what can a website do that other forms of media can't do. Actually, Cheryl, I would like to pass those questions for you. I know you're the NHD in Kentucky coordinator, so you see websites at the regional level, at the affiliate level, at the NHD Kentucky contest, and at the national level. <laughs> So what are some things that you find either appealing or unappealing in an NHD website? Well, first I would concur with pretty much everything that has been said so far. Uh, some just small tips that I've seen, and as a website user, uh, it's kind of popular sometimes to have your video or your audio clips start as soon as you go to the page. I would encourage you to avoid that uh, just because you never necessarily know where someone will be viewing your website and you don't want them to go to it and then automatically have like a large volume coming at them. So you want to make it where they know that they need to push play but that it's not automatically starting. Uh, you want to, I think, be careful about uh, your font colors in addition to the size as was mentioned. 
And we always tell people to think about what their actual topic is and let that guide your uh, kind of font color and font size decision. So you don't necessarily want to pick what is your favorite color, but you want to think about how it will relate to your topic so that it's not the only thing that the judge is noticing. You don't want them to have on your comment, I didn't even pay attention to what their topic was because I was so distracted by the color and font size or I couldn't read it or things like that. So little things like that can that can just really keep the focus on your content and not cause the judge to be distracted by uh, the stuff that's sort of anachronistic with your uh, topics. So those kinds of things are not starting music and sound and really thinking about your font color choices, your color background choices, things like that that can make it a more appealing website to people. Um, and then the big win that they mention also making it so that it's not all text where they're scrolling for minutes and minutes and minutes to find your information. Uh, so those are some pretty big ones that I always have people focus on. Well, that's a good kind of haven't already been talking about. <laughs> it's kind of a good organizational strategy, just like you would chunk your paragraphs in an essay, or you would have breaks or scene changes in a performance or in a play. The same ideas apply here, and you know I think that's a good point about your color should match what you're doing. If your topic's on the Holocaust and you choose lime green and bright hot pink, that might be a little distracting. But if so you're using, it, it, <laughs> um, and then, but you know, depending on what you're doing, certain colors can work. But just make sure that your words are readable, because if the judge is straining to read your words, that's going to be challenging for them, and that's obviously what you don't want. So make sure you can see it, and make sure you can see it maybe sitting back a little bit of a distance from your computer too. And also, another. I just what, add one thing is that when you're writing a paper, you know, you're you're proofreading it and you're spell checking it and you're making sure all the grammar is correct. You have to do the exact same thing with a website. Just because you might use fewer words or it's um, sort of maybe a more conversational tone, which is good. I, I'm all for sort of more conversational tones on a website. You still need to proofread it and still need to spell check it and still need to be sure that it make it's making sense to your readers. I, one last thing too, I would caution you when you're putting your website together and the tabs that you put at the top of the page for the headings to direct people, uh, be uh, considerate of your drop down menus. It's just a kind of a, you want to make sure that it's neat. Keep going back to that clean and uncluttered and if you have one tab but then it has a drop down of 20 different pages, that might be a little confusing to someone who's viewing it. Uh, they might forget where they have gone and they might get lost and they might easily miss something that is actually relatively important to your argument. So anything that you have as a separate page, you really want to make sure that it is always supporting your um, argument throughout and isn't just there as extraneous material. So you might find that you need fewer kinds of uh, subheadings and headings than you might think you need. Great. Okay, Mr. Johnson, what else do your students have? What creative elements do you use when creating a website? So the creative elements to be used when creating a website? What creative elements could you include in a website? Um, do you mean like um, art and things like that? Things that are maybe um, additions to the content that you're showcasing? I assume sort of that's what you mean? Yeah. Uh, um, I think that's great. I think, uh, for example, on our website on the front page, I think there's an image there. Um, we added, you know, some drawings. I don't know if you can see that there, but we added some drawings of certain dishes or um, a little, a couple of flourishes, things that are little decorative elements, just to make it a much, to make it an attractive website. So it's not just, you know, black text on white background. Um, so colors, um, things. If we want people to transcribe something or inviting people to participate, making sure the button is quite large and and you know, um, you can't miss it. So just really inviting. But I think I think artistic flourishes are really are fantastic. I think it's just about being consistent um, and not having you know um, too many uh, different kinds of art or you've got you know, photography here and a drawing here. I think it's all about just creating an aesthetic or can creating a look 
and then using drawings or photography or whatever to enhance it. So it's just kind of being consistent and having um, a, a consistent look and feel. And I think it's also just go to your favorite websites um, and what do you like about them and how do you how do they work really well and taking some just sort of thinking about what sites you like and what they have and trying to incorporate that into your own website. Okay. Mr. Johnson, let's do one more question, then we're going to move to some high school questions, and we'll try to come back for a couple more. What is the best way to put primary sources on to a website? Ah, well, here's a good question. So, Rebecca, when students do an NHD website, they can't link out to a source. So, for example, if they wanted to use one of your menus as a primary source, they would have to take a copy of that image and insert it into the website. Okay. What are some other, what are some ways that you could give them some tips in terms of putting some primary sources into their websites? So, they can't link out... Correct. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, they can't link out to certain sites. Okay, so for certain, um, for things that are available, let's say, on the Library of Congress website or the National Archives website, um, you can, you know, I assume you can embed some of those images, um, but as long as you cite it and it's in the public domain and it's available, um, I would just, what we do is, you know, we take some of those images and as long as we cite it and maybe provide the URL for where, for where it came from, um, that's a great way of incorporating primary sources. And I'm sure your library, your school library has a lot of um, databases and websites that make a lot of primary sources available and so incorporating some of those into your site and to your website, as long as you cite it um, and it's for educational purposes, um, you should be okay. Cheryl, I'm going to pass kind of a version of this question on to you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we find is that our students, because they find primary sources, they want to put every single primary source they can possibly find. So yeah. you'll see a website that'll have 25 Chronicling America articles in it, and it'll have 50 pictures in a slideshow. Uh, I know that makes Karen at the NEH very, very happy. But sometimes <laughs> it doesn't make our, NEH, our NHD judges very happy. Can you talk a little bit about selection of primary sources and some <laughs> tips for students as they're building these websites? Yeah, this kind of goes back, I think, to an earlier question that you also asked, Rebecca, as far as like providing uh, context for images and things. And I have been hammering this to students for years now is that kind of goes back to my art historical background that sometimes you have a lot of images and you think they're all really awesome but either they're basically the same image over and over uh, but they don't really relate to your topic uh, or they have no relationship to your topic and you just really kind of think they're cool. I always tell people to really be intentional about their selection. You want to think about all of those things that Rebecca kind of mentioned, the context of the image, what it's actually saying about your topic, how it is going to support your argument. So, for example, if you're doing a project on George Washington, hundreds of portraits of George Washington out there, and you might want to put one in there, but you don't want to put all 50 of them about George Washington because that's too many. So you want to pick the one that can tell you a little bit of something about the George Washington that you are talking about. So whatever moment of his leadership or legacy that you're talking about in your website, you want to think about an image of him that might help support that argument or it's him, maybe it's him on a battlefield or something like that. But you don't want to pick all of the images of George Washington crossing the Delaware and then all of the ones of him standing behind a table because they're not going to support your argument and they're going to just blur the lines of what you're trying to say. So that's just kind of a way that I always encourage people to think about their use of primary source images so that they don't put 50 of the same thing on there. Does that kind of help? Absolutely. That ties into that idea of editing, of having a lot mm -hmm. of things. That's what research is. But then when we go into that project creation of saying, okay, out of this, I used to say to my students when I was an NHD teacher, what are the diamonds? What are the things that you absolutely can't live without? and start building around those documents and then decide which of the other ones need to be there and which of the other ones maybe aren't right because they're the wrong time period or the wrong context or you know you changed your focus and it's something you found early in your research. 
Great, thank you. Let's go ahead. Uh, I know, Mr. Wagner, some of your students in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, got a little stuck uh, with a school activity tonight, but I know they left you some questions, and you're, thanks for standing in for them. Sure. Um, actually, the, the first question we had kind of ties in with what Cheryl was just talking about. Um, one of the big questions that came up was, what are the what are good types of primary sources to use on websites? Because everyone seems to be stuck on photographs or just a work of art. What are some of the other things that judges like to see besides those? Well, Cheryl, why don't you go ahead and start, and then yeah. I'm going to pass to Rebecca. What are some kinds okay. of primary sources that maybe students don't think about right away that you might want to suggest that they consider for a website? Uh, with websites, you kind of can run the gamut because it's so interactive. And so uh, if they're doing a project where there might be clips of speeches or video clips of speeches, I know like Teddy Roosevelt has some really old school audio and video of his speeches. They can include uh, some of those as primary sources. Um, I see, I tend to see a lot of uh, primary source documents of uh, either songs or maybe uh, speeches again, maybe some newspaper articles. They might have the document of, I don't know, like the Declaration of Independence, but then a brief little uh, transcript that's legible of the parts that they're focusing on. And so they could do the visual ones, you know, photographs and artworks are really, you know, appealing and go toward the eye, but they want to try and show, I think, a little bit more depth of the kinds of primary sources that they're using. Uh, they could consider even images of census records at some point. You can find uh, downloadable images of those that they can pull out information from. Um, other kinds of diaries they could are really easy to find the one page of and put that on there. So they can think of those uh, kinds of primary sources. Um, I just think it's kind of key also to make sure that if there's a part of it that they find is important, that they're able to provide some sort of translation of it for the viewer there. So all kinds of things. That's a really good point. So if you have a text heavy to really pull out what are the key two or three sentences that that, you know, that, that judge or that viewer really needs to see. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca, I'll let you answer that and then I'm going to pull it, I'll shoot over to Karen for the same question. Go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think manuscripts and diaries, um, speeches and, and film clips are fantastic if you have access to those. Maps are really great and, and strong. Um, menus you could use. Um, mm -hmm. So there are lots of primary sources available and I think there are just many more primary sources that are available online than ever before um, and sometimes you won't find them always through Google but you'll find them through library websites um, and just explore museum websites. A lot of a lot of these websites have you know, primary source um, sections or sections for students and teachers. So I would just cast a wide net to those kinds of um, those websites to see what's available. But I think anything, you know, that um, I think images are fantastic, but I think diaries and manuscripts and rare books would be considered um, a primary source as well. Posters, um, things you know, the, the ephemera, the kinds of ephemera that I was talking about as well um, can be really can be really great as well. Advertisements, all of that. Great. Karen, let me toss that off to you. Same question. Well, I just wanted to mention that, as we talked about earlier, Chronicling America is a really good resource. We have over six million digitized historic newspapers uh, pages in this database. And um, the way it works is you can actually clip just an image. Many of these newspaper pages have poems, um, artwork, uh, just the headlines are very striking. And it, the database covers 36 states now and the District of Columbia. So you get a really wonderful regional look at national news. Um, and it runs from... Uh, uh, 1836 to 1922. I'm gonna, you're going to have to check the website <laughs> for those exact dates. Uh, I, for some reason, don't have that at the top of my mind, but it's a really nice range of dates, um, and they're all in the public domain, and the citation that is so important is right there ready for you to just uh, cut and paste. So I really recommend um, checking out Chronicling America. 
Excellent. Those are all really good suggestions. I'm going to throw one more out because we're talking leadership and legacy. Sometimes when you get really lucky as a researcher, you can find papers. So you can find letters that are written between that leader and maybe other leaders or other people of the time period. And again, you're not always going to find them and not every topic is going to work. And the further back in time you go and the further away geographically you go, the less likely it is. But finding those, even one or two, can sometimes be a really neat find in your project. Mr. Wagner, what other questions did your students have? One of the ones that I wanted to ask, especially with, with the experts, was what are some key items that you really should see on the home page? Because sometimes it can be really cluttered with a lot of information, but you want to force your reader to go elsewhere. So what are some key aspects to include just on the home page? Well, well, that's a good point. And actually, I'm going to toss this to Cheryl first and then to Rebecca, because there's a new NHD rule this year about what absolutely positively has to end on that home page. So I'm going to start with that, and then we're going to toss it over to Rebecca to talk about some ideas of what might get your person's attention. Because really, the home page is the first thing that anybody sees when they go to a website. So Cheryl, what absolutely has to be on that home page this year? So. I knew this was going to come to me, uh, but if they haven't already looked at it, on page 34 of the new rule book, it's really handy um, that NHD has written down this year, and it tells them exactly what we need to see on the home page. So that would be the name of the student or students if they're working in a group, the title of their project, what division they're participating in, new for this year, the number of student composed words and then the number of words in their process paper. So according to the rule book, that absolutely needs to be on their home page. Uh, they can, I think, play around a little bit with the font size to make it uh, stand out, font color, uh, the image that they have on their home page, uh, you know, things to consider as far as like location of the information that doesn't necessarily want to be at the bottom of the home page, uh, but it should be uh, relatively, I think, again, neat and uncluttered, but have that information as laid out in uh, the rule book for our purposes uh, with the NHD judges. Uh, but now I'm going to let Rebecca, I think, answer to see if there's anything else that uh, they recommend to see on the home page. Um, I think for the home page, like you said, just kind of clean and uncluttered, but also sort of an invitation for people to either continue reading the website or to participate depending on um, what the goal of the website is. Um, so, you know, an introduction is always really helpful, like what is the goal of this website, what are you trying to convey, what kind of information are you trying to convey, and then just a really easy navigation I think is always key. Um, and then some images, I think, um, depending on what the you know, again, the goal of the site is what can you put on that front page that will entice your readers to continue moving and, you know, and go into the website even more. Well, I think that's a good point. In theory, the home page is kind of like the first paragraph of your paper or the first two minutes of a presentation. We should get the gist of where you're going. We should know what you're going to cover and, most importantly, what's your argument? Mm -hmm. What is it that's going to make your product? So, for example, there will be multiple projects on the same topic. That's just the way it is. But what sets your George Washington project apart from somebody else's George Washington project? And, you know, I think it's always good, like you say, get people's attention. Because this is kind of like your first impression. You want someone to, who's on your website to go, oh, this is really neat. Let me click through this. And not, oh, this is another one. Do I really have to do this? So, you know, getting their interest and piquing that is really important. Mr. Wagner, let's do one more question and then I'm going to go for some of our questions from Twitter and that were sent in earlier today from all over the country. Actually, the last one is a piece of advice they wanted me to share because we've had it over the years. Everybody has them in their own backyard. Um, find two or three website designers from companies somewhere in your city or town and have them invite them in and have them look at the students' websites a month in advance of the competition. They'll give you incredible tips and insights that you maybe never would have thought of. So, a good piece of advice. 
That's a great tip. I think anytime students can get involved with community members with different skill sets, I think that that's absolutely fabulous. Um, here's a question. One of the things, Rebecca, that you mentioned is that it's important to help direct your viewer through the website. What are some tools that you can use on a website to help direct viewers and help them know how to go from point A to B to C? Well, I think, um, especially on the front page, having clear navigation. So. Um, um, for example, on what's on the menu, we have, you know, two kinds of information that's available to our users. We have menus, so if you want to just browse through menus or look through menus from the 1930s, 1940s, you can do that. But then we also have dishes. Um, so it's very clear from the front page what is available, um, so you can um, decide what, how you're going to navigate the site. Um, so really just having sort of a clear navigation based on what you're trying to convey. So if you're doing a paper, you're doing a website on George Washington, um, and you're going over his legacy, you could do, you know, um, George Washington as president or, you know, George Washington the man or, you know, you could um, sort of go over the history of George Washington um, through sort of some of the navigation so that the participants on your website have an idea of where to go for certain kinds of information. Great. One other question for you. Uh, one of the things that sometimes students are working on and really struggling with is titles uh, and trying to get a, a good, we call it a good NHD title. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to ask you, how did you come up with what's on the menu? Because that's certainly a really kind of fun, catchy one that kind of is on the style of a lot of our students. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I've always been told, I, I'm sort of in favor of kind of um, witty and sort of sometimes borderline silly titles, which is not necessarily a good thing um, because people can't always find it very easily if they're doing a Google search. You kind of want to make it sort of very basic. Um, so one of my ideas for what's on the menu had actually been doing the dishes, but um, that actually was vetoed. So um, what's on the menu was, was picked because it was sort of literal. It was like, well, we just actually want to know what is on the menu. We want people to transcribe the dishes on each menu. So it was, it, it was, we were really calling out to, you know, our users to participate and asking them what is on the menu. So in some ways it was, it was a very simple um, title. Um, so I think there's trying to find that that line between being kind of catchy and witty and fun with, you know, keeping it quite simple and really, um, so when somebody comes to your site, they have an idea of what they're getting into or not getting into, but what will be expected of them. Um, so yeah, I think titles, but then if you look at something like Google, you know, we take it for granted now, you know, you're going to Google it. But if you think about Google as a title, you know, it's kind of, it's a word that you know you don't hear very often. So, but now we take it for granted. So it's kind of just trying to find that 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 line between interesting and fun and just very basic and to the point. Excellent, Cheryl. I have two questions from you for you from students that came in. One of the students said, "Well, what if I just can't really find the source of my image or my video clip? Do I really need to credit it there?" What's the NHD um, judge answer here? <laughs> yes, you need to credit your source. Uh, if you cannot find uh, the citation for it after due diligence of searching, and I'm talking about if you have just done a Google image search and you're struggling to find it, if it goes to a website, then the person who used it should have cited it themselves. Uh, if they haven't, then and you can't find it anywhere else, then you probably should not use it in your website just to be on the safe side because you don't know, you can't verify that it wasn't photoshopped and you can't verify to properly credit where it's come from and if you don't properly cite it then that's going to be considered plagiarism in the eyes of an NHD judge. Uh, Some suggestions for trying to find where it actually came from if it seems like it's a really popular kind of image that you see popping up a lot of places, you might want to try a place like the Library of Congress to see if it uh, is from there. Uh, you might want to try if it's from your home state. Uh, you want to try. You may want to try hitting up a local librarian or a university librarian to see if they can help you uh, track down the image because reference librarians are really good about hunting things down. And so you want to, if it's a really awesome image that you think is going to be the make or break it for your website, 
then you really do want to go a little bit farther to try and find that proper citation. Um, and no, properly citing it does not mean just citing the Google URL. So. That's really important because every image comes from somewhere. Citing Google is kind of like saying, well, I got the source in the library. <laughs> well, that's great. But there's an awful lot, even in any local library. Uh, one other quick thing I wanted to bring up. I did get a student question about using Scribd. Um, we have taken Scribd out of the Weebly package. And there's a reason behind that. It's not to be mean, I promise. We've taken it out because we found that it's blocked in a lot of schools. So what was happening was students were doing things like putting their annotated bibliography in Scribd. And then judges who were looking at it in a school setting were blocked and couldn't see it. And if a judge can't see your work, they can't properly credit you or judge you. And that's something we want to make sure that all our students get a fair shot at judging. So, Cheryl, what's the best way for a student to put their annotated bibliography into their website? Because those have to go into there. So I've found that I think a couple of uh, different approaches can work with the way that Weebly works. One is to uh, create your annotated bibliography in a Word document and to copy and paste that into uh, Weebly just to uh, make the best attempt to ensure that it saves your uh, formatting and things like that. You don't want to type it directly into Weebly because that can just be very confusing and unwieldy. Uh, also to save the document uh, as a PDF and upload the PDF directly to uh, Weebly uh, should uh, make it to where it can be viewed and downloaded. Uh, so the Scribd thing is a little bit new, I think, for us too, but uh, those two ways have been ways that I've found that work with Weebly when I use it. Well, those are a lot of really great questions and answers, so I just need to say thank you to everybody who spent the hour with us. I'm going to turn things over to Karen to wrap it up at the end, but we do need to ask for everybody who's watching live, and even if you're watching after the fact, right below this video we have a link to a survey that gives us feedback, so if you could take just a moment and click it, it's actually it's very simple, it's very fun, and it gives us some good feedback moving forward. So thanks so much. Uh, Karen, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I can't thank Rebecca enough for all her insight tonight and for all the preparation she did um, going into this Hangout. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you to all our participants, the students, the educators, the coordinator. It takes a village to do National History Day, so we thank all of you. And yes, thank you for filling out that survey in advance. It really gives us some really important information for how to make these hangouts as useful as possible. So Lynn, thanks for coordinating and thanks for my team behind the scenes, Caitlin, and uh, we'll see you next time. Excellent. We will be back actually next Monday, which is Monday, December 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be focusing on writing for NHD. So our primary focus is papers next Monday night. However, we know that every History Day student is a writer and that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to start about talking about writing like you're writing for a paper and then we're actually going to talk about how to turn that writing into a documentary and into a website and a performance and one of the most challenging turning it into a visual exhibit. So feel free to join us on December 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. As always all of these will be archived at nhd.org slash hangouts.htm. Thanks so much. Have a great evening.